Greetings from the Emerging Issues Commons on NC State's Centennial Campus. We hope that your 2021 is coming to a safe and joyful end. Today we want to share with you a special episode of First in Future. During this episode, we talk with North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper and ask him to look back to 2021 and forward to 2022. Along the way, he talks about the impact of the Omicron variant coming up. He looks at what we might do to get more people back into the workplace, how we might get 400,000 more people with skills and abilities beyond high school into the North Carolina workforce by the end of 2030. He tries to imagine what we might need to do in order to get more people to adopt broadband in their home. And his Office of Digital Equity and Literacy, the first of its kind in the country, which we think is going to make a huge difference for North Carolina's ability to work, learn, and get health care from home. And he talks about the hurricane's chances for a Stanley Cup in 2022. One final note, uh, Governor Cooper does not answer, and we don't quite ask the question of whether he will be a presidential candidate if President Biden does not run in 2024. Let's take a listen. Governor Cooper, thank you for being with us. Glad to be with you, Les, and thank you for the work you guys are doing. Let's start with the pandemic, because I think all conversations for the past couple of years probably have with you. Uh, I was reminded as, as I was trying to think about this question about something Winston Churchill said about the middle of World War II. He said, this is not the end, it's not the beginning of the end, but it may be the end of the beginning. And I think it's probably pretty true with this uh, virus and this pandemic that we're in. I'm wondering if you could sort of look ahead to 2022 and tell North Carolinians what you think they should expect from this virus. Well, well first, I think we have to acknowledge what a difficult 21 months it's been for not only the people of North Carolina, but the world. Um, this, this pandemic has obviously made a lot of people sick, they've lost their lives, but it's also hit people in many ways, in, in mental health and loneliness and job loss. But I think I'm proud of the work we've done in North Carolina. Uh, there was a study done a few months ago showing North Carolina among the lowest states in COVID deaths and job loss per capita. Uh, people's lives are most important, but also their livelihoods are, are critical as well. And I think we have taking the right kind of balanced approach. The good thing about all this, we know what gets us to the other side, vaccines. If you're vaccinated and boosted, you have an excellent layer of protection against serious illness and death. And I do believe we will emerge from this stronger than ever. Our, our key is to get it to the endemic stage. And you know we're working toward that. As you and I sit here, we have the Omicron variant that's going to cause a surge, but the, the good news in that is vaccinated and boosted people are well protected. So if you have any takeaway from this, I think the future is bright. We're going to get to the other side of this. The way to do it is to talk with friends, family, do everything you can to convince people to get vaccinated and boosted We've learned that with Omicron, that a booster matters in that level of protection for you. You may get the virus, but the chance of serious illness and death is, is very low. So I'm proud of North Carolinians and the work we've done, and I think our best days are ahead. In many ways, the present is bright, too. I want to bring up just two kind of data points and, and ask you to respond to each of them. But also, there's a challenge associated with both of them. The first is uh, unemployment, way down from the peak of 13.5% to 4.1% last month. Uh, but participation rates still down. So uh, one of your analysts has estimated that if people were participating in the labor force at the same rate they were pre-pandemic, we'd have an additional 161,000 people out there. So low unemployment, but employers are having trouble finding people. And I'm wondering if you could do any kind of 
parceling out of what that's about, what percentage of it is nervousness about COVID, what percentage of it might be child care, what percentage of it might be a need to change wages. So you've, you've named three things that are really important in this. I, I will say, you layer on top of that, we're attracting and creating jobs in this state in both our rural and, and, and urban areas at a record pace. So we know that there are a lot of businesses, small businesses that are going to expect a workforce. And a lot of the jobs that are being created these days are better paying jobs. So we want people to be able to, to fulfill it. You mentioned something, child care. That's critically important. A, a number of parents, when you, when you have to pay 25 to 30% of your income on child care, sometimes you figure that, you know, I'll, I, I'd just rather stay home with my children and let my partner or my spouse work. We've got to get more quality child care out there. And that means attracting and, retra and retaining early childhood educators. One of the reasons I'm really advocating for the Build Back Better plan, because it's got some quality child care that limits people's expense for child care is 7% of their income. And uh, a couple making together $100,000 would say $5,000 a year on child care. That's a big deal. I think a number of people have changed careers in the middle of this pandemic, decided that what they were doing before is not really what they want to do now, whether because it was more interaction with the public or what have you. And so they, they have changed careers. Some people, because things are doing well in the stock market and others, they've just decided that they're going to stop work for a while and they can afford to do it. The people I'm worried about are the people on the margins, those who have been out there on the front lines. They don't have a choice. They got to put food on the table. We've got to help them. We've, we've got to make sure that more people in this state get covered with health care. We've got to make sure that they have opportunities for an education, adult education. Uh, you and I were talking about it before we went in here that uh, we promised to have uh, two million more adult North Carolinians with a post-secondary degree or credential in the next decade. So we've got to make sure our community colleges and our universities are available for people to be able to get these advanced degrees. A lot of reasons for that. I'm so glad that we're creating so many good paying jobs, but I also know we've got to come together to get the people the kind of qualifications and education they need to take them so we can keep moving the state forward. You're talking about the goal set by My Future NC, which you and a lot of others came together on across party lines to say, this is what we think we need. And one of the findings they have is that if we don't do anything about it, we're going to be up to 400,000 people short yeah. by 2030. And uh, this budget that you signed invests a lot in increasing the capacity of NC State and UNC Charlotte and NC a &T to educate more engineers, but clearly there's a lot more work to do there. And a lot of it's probably going to involve retraining adults and providing other opportunities for them to get there. At the same time, we're number one in Site Selection Magazine, so yeah. these companies keep wanting to come That's right. to North Carolina. They're, obviously, Toyota came, announced a couple of weeks ago, there are 20 other projects in the pipeline that would be a billion dollars more in investment. So how do we balance this uh, low unemployment and yet ongoing demand for North Carolina? How do we get the people there that we need to keep the state growing? So I was proud of this bipartisan budget that I was able to sign. It does a lot with investments in K through 12, community colleges and universities, but we've got to do a lot more. And when you talk about being potentially 400,000 people short, a lot of that is related to the affordability of being able to get the degree or credential that they need. One of the things that I've advocated for that this budget did some of, but needs to do more of, is scholarships for people, our finish line grants, which help people who are almost finished with a degree or they, and they run into some financial problem, whether it's a car repair or childcare or medical bill, helps them get across the finish line and get that degree. 
uh, more investments and scholarships to help those people on the line. A lot of these adults that we want to get trained for these new jobs have to work and go to school at the same time. And not only is that sometimes tough on time, it's tough to afford it. So we need to provide more financial assistance to try to help get them there. And of course, continuing to support our community colleges and universities so that they can have good teachers, professors, the curriculum being more flexible and adaptive to the kind of jobs of, of today and tomorrow that we know are coming and rapidly changing. It's exciting to think about, but it's also challenging because we got a lot of work to do. UNC system got in this budget nearly $100 million to expand a new online learning program that they have called Kitty Hawk that I think would go a long way toward helping adults who don't want to necessarily quit their jobs uh, and may live in a rural area get that kind of brush up on their education that they need in order to get there. How important do you think it is to build off of the potential of say medium-sized cities. We see a lot of growth in North Carolina coming to Charlotte and the Triangle, not as much to the rural areas, 51 out of 100 counties losing population, including Nash and Edgecombe. Uh, is there a play that we can make maybe with this new uh, online availability and the increasing availability of broadband that might particularly apply to the mid-sized cities that uh, could be kind of anchors for the regions that they're in. One of the things I'm most excited about in this budget that I signed that was augmented by American Rescue Plan and the infrastructure legislation passed uh, in Washington is that we now have the funding to connect every household and business in the state to high-speed internet access. That is something that we've always wanted to do. Now we have the funding to do it. So we have to remember that it's not just the fiber and the connection. It's also about people being able to afford to connect, to have the devices to connect, and to be able to have the literacy to, to know how to do it. And we see a lot of our communities on the margin, communities of color, rural communities who are not connected and who do need help. And I've established in my Department of Information and Technology an, an office of diversity and, excuse me, equity and digital literacy to pay attention to those things. And, and I've encouraged our internet service providers to apply, get their customers to apply for this emergency broadband payment, which supplements them being able to get online. So when you think about the university going, taking this ambitious online education on. I think it's the right thing to do. In fact, this pandemic, you always try to find the good things in the bad. And one thing this has done, it's flung us at least 10 years into the future. And part of that is what education is going to look like. So I'm glad that our universities are going to be on top of that. But I'm even more glad that we're going to be, get, be able to get our state connected and get people learning online, getting health checkups and, and medical care and mental health, substance use disorder treatment online, and, and being able to, to connect small businesses in these medium-sized cities, in rural communities, to global markets. And it, it's exciting. You're a little modest there. This Office of Digital Equity, Equity and Literacy is the first in the nation yes. like it. And uh, there is, as part of this budget, a little north of $50 million that you have to work with to move this forward, which is not as much as the amount for access, but it, it is an important commitment, I think, that you're making to digital equity and literacy. And I think one of the, one of the nice things about it is that it recognizes there is a two-part process. There is access, but then there's got to be affordability and literacy. And those two things together, can you just talk about the value of that pairing and, and what, yeah. what that additional availability might do for North Carolina? You have to be intentional about what you do. And right now we've got about 73% of our households connected. We want to get that, that up to 80% 
across the state, but we want to get to 100% for families that have school children because we know how important that is. And we see, just as you would expect, just in health, as in healthcare and in other areas, that in our communities of color, in our Hispanic households, the connection rate is lower. So we realized that part of getting our state connected is not just the hardware, but affordability, people getting some help in connecting, getting devices that they may need to be connected and, and making sure they learn how to do it. And this office is gonna be laser focused on that. It's gonna be work, working with community leaders, faith leaders, and others to bring awareness of this and to get people connected. It, it, it's going to be positive for our state. It's going to help our economy, and it's going to help people prosper more. You're coming into year six of your governorship, uh, three years, three full years left. And I'm wondering what you think still needs to get done. Yeah. What, is, what is out there that is, has been elusive to you? Well, we have to get more people covered with health insurance. When you have more than a million North Carolinians who don't have access to health care, who don't have health insurance, most of them working, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. Uh, as much as I believe that the good far outweighed the bad in this budget, and I'm excited to have signed it, still didn't expand Medicaid. And that has to be on the agenda as we go into the new year, making sure we press the yes button, get all of those federal dollars down here. We don't need state tax dollars to do this. And you have a lot of everyday working people who may be working two jobs, and because they work each part-time, they don't qualify for health insurance, or it may be a small business that can't afford to provide health insurance, or it may be a worker who's making a little bit too much to be able to get Medicaid right now, but not enough to qualify for federal subsidies under the Affordable Care Act, and they're stuck in this donut hole, and there's over a million people like that in our state. We have to close that gap. This budget did a little bit, but not nearly enough. The second thing is, is we still have work to do to ensure that every child in the state gets their constitutional right to a sound basic education. And we, we have to focus on the whole child. We have to, to, and I was able to use some of the governor's, what we call the, the gear funding that we got from the federal government to do more of this, but, but we need more counselors and psychologists and school nurses. We need more teacher assistants. We need to make sure that we, we attract and retain good educators I have a drive task force that's working on recruiting uh, educators of color because the research is overwhelming that not only do children of color do better when their educators are diverse, all students do. And we have a, a real difference in the, the faculty in our public schools and the population of our public schools when it comes to, to, to race and ethnicity. So we've got a lot of work to do in those areas. I'm excited about the opportunity to lead the state where I grew up that I love so much, that is, in, that is the best state in the country. We've done so many good things, but there's more to do. Those are the areas where I'm gonna concentrate on. I didn't even mention our clean energy economy and putting a carbon standard on power generation in our state to not only tackle climate change, but to, uh, create clean energy jobs, that's going to be an exciting future. And we got to make sure that all of that gets implemented. We get more electric vehicles on the road here in our state. And all of those are going to be daunting challenges, but ones that I truly look forward to, to tackling in the new year. You've recently taken over as head of the Democratic Governors Association and are asked to sort of have a perspective that is national in nature. Uh, and as part of that, recently, the New York Times has suggested that if President Biden doesn't run for a second term, that would be something that uh, a Roy Cooper would be perfect for. So I'm not going to ask you about that. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, uh, unless you want to talk about it, uh, 
I wonder if you could talk about what the value of having that kind of national perspective is as you try to bring a series of solutions to North Carolina. Are you able to learn from what others are doing and, and take that and apply it in North Carolina? States are the laboratories of democracy. And we can learn from other states and states can learn from us about things that work. I worked with governors all over the country, not only on education, but when this pandemic came, uh, governors had to lead the way. Uh, the Trump administration was not enamored with doing the things that it needed to do to fight this pandemic. Governors stepped up and led the way and realized more and more how important it was to have strong governors across the country. So, you know, I want to see that that happens. I want us to be able to exchange ideas and I look forward to, to being uh, involved in not only those races, but also the policy ideas that, that occur at the state level, because that's where real change can happen. Uh, you know, the United States senators, they get the most attention. Good governors get stuff done. And we have to. Looking forward to, to that challenge as well recent news conference, you were cited with a Hurricanes mask on. I know you're a huge Canes fan. Uh, two points out last time I checked from first place. What's your prediction for 2022 and a possible Stanley Cup in North Carolina? I think we're tied for first right now because of the win last night. Uh, this is a really good team. And the thing I like about this Hurricanes team is that they leave it all on the ice. Uh, there's times, sometimes teams can lose focus and uh, they don't put the kind of effort they need. This team is, reflects Coach Rod Brendamore and is always on, always giving in their best. The few times they do lose, you don't say it's because of lack of effort. That's what you got to love about this team. And I'm excited. I think uh, a Stanley Cup is a real potential here. Looking I'm thinking of that. them as a broken nose team, which I think is pretty good. Uh, probably a good description. Good description. Uh, final message for North Carolina as we head into this holiday season and look forward to 2022. What would you like people to know and be thinking about this state that we all live in? I, I know this, this Christmas, this Thanksgiving, this holiday time uh, is different this year than last year. I think, you know, we're, we were in the middle of a raging pandemic. We did not have vaccines last year. This year we do. This year we have opportunities to be safer and gather together. Remember that we all have to depend on each other. Remember that even in this hyper-partisan time that, that we live in, everybody wants to make sure their child has a good education. Everybody wants to have good health care coverage and a good paying job and clean water to drink. Uh, we can do those things. I, I hope we all will work to be more civil to each other and tolerant of each other, continue to fight for what we believe, but feel fortunate that we do live in the best state in the country and that all of us have a duty to try and work together to make it better. The weak grow strong and the strong grow great. That they do. Governor Cooper, thank you for your time. Thanks, Leslie. Enjoyed it. All right. A lot to reflect on there. I hope as we look back on 2021, we can think back on what we learned during that year. And as we look forward to 2022, we can imagine what we can do together in the future. Special thanks today to II Communications Director Greg Hedgepath, and first and future producer James Herrick for their help with this episode. Happy holidays. We'll see you in the future.